So welcome back. This is section 7, which is about the NLP communication model. The purpose of this model is to get a better grasp of what's really happening in communication between people and how people's thinking then produces the behaviour. The first place to start with this is just to remind you that you create your perception of reality inside your own neurology. All that you see, hear, feel, smell and taste is converted into electrical impulses that are interpreted by your brain. You don't see with your eyes as such. Your eyes gather and focus light onto the retina at the back of the eye, which then translates the information into electrical nerve impulses that are interpreted by your brain. Have you ever had the experience of seeing something in the distance, and maybe it looks kind of wrong or out of place, and then as you look at it for a little longer, it changes from what you thought you were seeing into what it really is? Even as you look at your hand and, say, rub your fingers together, You are seeing your hand and you're feeling your fingers touching, but it's your brain that creates this tableau for you. Everything is simply in your head. This is not a problem per se, it's just the base point to start with to begin now to understand that your experience is simply your own personal perspective. Important and unique though it is, it will always remain your perspective. I can never have your experience. You can never have anyone else's experience. All of your appreciation of yourself and others, all of your understanding of communication needs to start with an understanding of this. So let me talk through the diagram of the NLP communication model in a big picture sense first of all. When we have an experience we take information in through our five senses. Visual, pictures, auditory sounds, kinesthetic feelings, olfactory smell and gustatory taste. Our filters in our neurology then delete, distort and generalise that information as it comes in. It's our filters, our attitudes, our values and beliefs, our metaprograms, our memories, our decisions, our language and finally time, space, matter and energy that do the process of deletion, distortion and generalisation for each of us. So we filter our experience, then we make an internal representation of that experience. The internal representation is again coded in the five senses, as pictures, sounds, feelings and then smells and tastes and then we also label our experiences or talk to ourselves about our experiences with our self-talk, our internal dialogue, which in NLP we refer to as our auditory digital sense, our thinking and language sense. Now, if I asked you what your favourite food is, as you think about how much you like your favourite food, Ask yourself, do you have a picture? If you are able to bring a picture into your awareness from your unconscious, then there is a good chance that that is your internal representation for how much you like your favourite food. And it will be coded to a greater or lesser extent in all of these senses. Now, our internal representation is connected to our state, which is the sum of how we feel, be that happy, sad, excited, anxious, etc. And our state is connected to our physiology, which is how your body is positioned, how you're breathing, what's your heart rate, and other aspects of our physiology. And it's these three things together, internal representation, which is what you're focused on, state and physiology, which are all connected and together they determine what your behaviour is. So if you want to change your behaviour, you need to change either or all of your internal representation, your state and your physiology. It also says there at the bottom of the page, what you focus on determines your results. What you focus on is your internal representation and because it's linked to your state and physiology, produces your behaviour. That makes what we focus on in life, our internal representations, really important. For example, if you feel anxious, then you're focusing on what you don't want. Now, sometimes it's perfectly okay to focus on what you don't want because you can plan, you can check what you can do now to change your situation. What actions can you take? Once you've done that, then focus on what you want. If you had a presentation at work coming up or a speech to do socially, then you might feel anxious about that prospect. It's very normal. Many people would. This is because we often tend to think about things like this not working out the way that we'd like them to. 
Maybe because we've had bad experiences in the past or we don't know what we're going to say. So to help deal with that, you could imagine doing some preparation and that would make you feel less anxious. And once you'd actually done the preparation and you're about to make the presentation, then you still have responsibility to maintain a positive representation of carrying out the presentation, imagining people wanting to hear what you've got to say, rather than focusing on it being a complete disaster. So I'll go through the filters individually, shortly. Just before that, let's look at the ideas of deletion, distortion and generalisation. Deletion occurs when we selectively pay attention to particular aspects of our experiences, and not others. Without deletion, we would be faced with too much information for us to effectively process, consciously or unconsciously. Distortions happen when we make shifts of data in our sensory experience, by misrepresenting what is real. For example, this can happen when we mistake somebody for somebody else, or when we think somebody said something when in fact they said something else or even imagining how the interior of a room would look before you decide to decorate it. This is still a distortion, though a positive one. Generalisation is where we draw like conclusions about someone or something based upon one or two experiences. Generalising helps us to learn and teach by taking the information we have and drawing conclusions about the meaning of the effect of these conclusions. Although generalising at its worst can allow us to form disempowering beliefs about ourselves and our capabilities, which can hold us back in life. So all of these processes can be useful, but they can also lead us to create limitation in our lives too. So now let's talk a little bit about your filters. We are all unique, and we've all had unique experience, and it's this understanding of just how unique we are that comes from our filters. In fact, you are being bombarded by information from your environment all the time, and through your filters you are largely unconsciously choosing which bits of that information to pay attention to, and it's your filters that do that choosing for you. So looking at the individual filters that we have here, attitudes are collections of values and beliefs about a particular subject. What's your attitude towards school? What's your attitude towards work, Mondays, food, exercise, alcohol? Values are how we decide what's good or bad, right or wrong. They help us decide how we feel about our actions. You feel negative emotions in life because someone's violated one or more of your values. Values are aspects of life which are important to us. They can change with context. You will have values about what you want from a relationship or what you want from a career. Values are arranged in a hierarchy with the most important one typically being at the top and the less important ones below that. They tend to be individual words like trust, success, independence, honesty, fun. If you've ever worked in an organisation where you felt you didn't fit in, then it's likely that your values were out of alignment with other people's values in that organisation. Similarly, we can be attracted to someone else and end up in a relationship with them, only to find that the relationship doesn't work out. Again, this may well be because your values weren't sufficiently aligned. Now, they don't need to be identical to those of your partner, but some sense of similarity is useful. Beliefs are assumptions that we have about the way the world is and about our capabilities. Beliefs can be either empowering or disempowering for us. They represent what we can and what we cannot do. So, positive beliefs might be something like, I believe I can run my own business. I believe I can be happy. I believe what other people do is their responsibility. Or you may have disempowering beliefs, like, I believe that life's hard, or I believe bad things happen to good people, or I believe I'm not good enough. One of the great things about NLP is that there are techniques whereby one can change negative or limiting beliefs, so that you can do what you want in life. In the next section, I'll also go through empowering beliefs that are useful to have about yourself and other people. Our next filter is called Metaprograms. Now these are innate preferences that you have. They can be a strong preference or a weak one. They include the Jungian Myers-Briggs filters, which some of you may have heard of or even utilised at work. From a Myers-Briggs perspective, there are four sets of two preferences, though from an NLP perspective there are these and more. The basic Jungian four sets are introvert and extrovert, sensor-intuitor, thinker-feeler and judger-perceiver. 
Your introvert-extrovert filter is about external behaviour. This was described by Carl Jung as an attitude preference. What's your attitude towards the external world that's evidenced by your behaviour? An introvert will prefer to be alone. They prefer the internal world of thoughts and ideas over the external world of people and things. Extroverts will want to be with people. Your sensor intuitive filter is about where you place your focus. An intuitor will prefer to perceive the possibilities, the relationships and the meaning of experiences. A sensor prefers to perceive the immediate, real, practical facts of experience and life. Intuitors tend to be big picture people and a sensor's first interest is in the details. Now with all of these pairs of meta programs, you can access and utilise both. You simply have a preference for one or the other. That's all. Think or Feeler is about the ability to access a certain internal state and is based on the question of whether a person is associated or dissociated. Thinkers are dissociated and they will make judgments or decisions objectively and impersonally, considering both the causes of events and where decisions may lead. A feeler will make judgments or decisions subjectively and personally, weighing the value of choices based on their past and how these values matter to others. Finally, judger perceiver. A judger wants to run their own life and prefers to live in a decisive, planned and orderly way. They aim to regulate and control events. A perceiver wants to let their life happen and will prefer to live a life in a spontaneous, flexible way. They aim to understand life and adapt to it. So you can get into a lot of detail with these and profile people's personality based on the interaction of these four basic programs, which is what is known as Myers-Briggs system. NLP has its own set of what we call complex metaprograms to add to these two. These include things like your listening and spe- speaking style. You can be a literal speaker or listener, or an inferential speaker or listener. For example, if someone you knew quite well said, I'm thirsty. Would you regard that as a call to action, which would make you an inferential listener? Or would you think, they're thirsty, and do no more with that information? Which if you did, you're listening more literally. So the next couple of filters that we have are decisions and memories. So there will have been times in your life when you made decisions about yourself. And again, these could be good, bad or indifferent. What often happens for us is that we have an emotional experience. And in the moment of that significant emotional experience, we decide something about ourselves. We then consciously forget that we made a decision, that we made a choice, but we then act out the decision in our lives as if it was real. But is it? These decisions tend to lead to beliefs that we have about ourselves. It's a similar thing with memories too. How do you know your memories are real anyway? Now, I'm not saying that they're not real, but how do you know that they are real? Have you ever had the experience of growing up in the same family or being at the same party or family event or meeting and come away with a totally different perception of what happened than other people have? We treat our memories as actual accurate records of what happened to us, but are they? Fritz Perls, who was the father of Gestalt therapy and another one of the therapists that was modelled to create NLP, used to say, whenever we access a memory, we change it. So what we need to take from this is the recognition that our memories, even of a shared event, are unique to us. And that, as one of our filters, our memories are filtering our current experience too. Our next filter is language. We use language, words, to describe our experiences. What we need to appreciate about this is that the words themselves are not the experience that they are describing. This is where the NLP term, the map is not the territory, comes from. The words people use are not necessarily the experience that they're describing. When you go to a restaurant, the menu is a linguistic description of the food, the map if you like, and then when the food actually comes, that's the experience. I'm sure there have been many times when you've ordered something off a menu at the restaurant and either been pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised when the food actually is delivered. People's language influences their view of the world, For example, bilingual people frequently say that they feel and or behave differently depending on the language that they're speaking. The words that we use mean something to us, but they don't always mean the same thing to other people as they mean to us. Using NLP, you want to use words that have an effect for other people as you communicate with them, 
not just the words that have an effect for you. There is also structure to language that if you have a better conscious understanding of will massively improve your ability to communicate with other people in your private life or your personal life. This is part of the content that we teach as part of the NLP practitioner training. Our final filter is time, space, matter and energy. This includes your neurology and is where your experience really is. It also includes the stuff that you're made of and how that works. I presume that you all know that the atoms that you're made of are 99.999% empty space. And every atom of your body that is not hydrogen or helium was made in the massive compressive forces of a star, ejected into space at its death and now reformed into you. You are stardust. You may not have ever thought about this before either, but notice now that all your life experience happens in one continuous now. In that sense, time is an illusion. Now is all there is. In fact, I know several people who wear watches, and for each number on the dial, all it says is now, instead of having a number. Because when you look at your watch, it is always right now. So your body and nervous system is an exquisite device for producing behaviour. But what is the behaviour that you are producing? Is it what you want or not? So as the name suggests, the NLP communication model is very important in terms of our communication. When you're communicating with someone else, you need to get your message out of your filters through their filters so that it has a positive effect on their behaviour. In NLP, you can uncover what your filters are and what other people's filters are. This can then improve your ability to communicate your message and to understand where other people are coming from. Using the change techniques in NLP, one can also change filters, change values and beliefs, and reevaluate memories, amongst other things. This is some of how NLP helps people to lead the life that they want and to be the best version of themselves that they can possibly be. So that's the end of this audio. And it's time to move on in the booklet to section 8, which is about empowering beliefs.